Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is V. I'm from Monash University, Australia. And uh, please excuse me if I say something nonsense because uh, it's still very early morning in Australia. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, before I just start my uh, presentation, I just give you, I think I will just give you some uh, background, uh, the context, so you know more about why I'm doing this. So uh, I graduated in 2022, and then I was working on a, a teaching focus position until now, so where I didn't really uh, did much on research. So this will be my... Uh, and then, and then I recently uh, accepted an, a new offer, job offer, uh, as a full-time lecturer where I got uh, some uh, research allocation, so where I can do some research. So that's why I'm proposing a new research. So this is something I haven't been done, so it's just something like I want to do uh, very soon. Okay, and uh, at Monash, I have been uh, teaching in the Faculty of IT. Uh, but particular po uh, focus is on the, uh, digital ethics. Um, you know, like we have data ethics, we have uh, artificial intelligence ethics, and so on. So, um, what I found that is, uh, okay, yeah. So this is the agenda of my research uh, that I want to propose. So uh, let me get to. Oh, hold on. Yes, it works. So uh, I found that the students, because Monash is, I think, the largest university in Australia and also the most uh, culturally diverse, like culturally diverse uh, university. So we have the students come from uh, different countries. And I found that my students, they have very different perspectives regarding the data ethics and, uh, and you know, and practice as well. So for example, like some really care or concern about their privacy, while the others is like, okay, as long as it's convenient, so they just give up their data. And also like the transparency and secrecy, like, you know, business, they can keep their own like uh, secret, like how they cook their data, your data, or like uh, they could be very transparent on the way they collect, they, they use or even destroy the data. So students very have totally different perspectives. And also, like, uh, can people use uh, they, your data to, to make money from that, uh, and so on. Uh, and sometimes I feel like it's very difficult for me just to try to convince my student that privacy is their human right, and they should keep it. You know, it's, I feel a little bit hopeless because uh, where they're from, that is something, you know, privacy and, and their data is just something that it should be give away in order to trade off to get the services. So that's why uh, that is what I found. And, uh, and uh, the significance of the research I want to propose that why do we care about data ethics? That because uh, you, I think everyone here, we all know about that. We are on the same page that we need to protect the privacy in general and other human rights that are associated with the data as well. And also we prevent the harms and also the unexpected consequences that uh, could come from the, you know, unethical use of data and so on. And also to uh, maintain and keep the fairness and equity and also uh, comply with the legislations and also have the ethical decision making and so on. So these are some reasons that I found that why people need to care about data ethics and uh, uh, data ethics education in general. And then, <clears throat> Okay, so I did some research and also based on my own experience, I found that there are some factors influence the, eth the ethical viewpoints regarding the data practices, like from students. And most of it because of uh, the cultural practices and the norms and values that students, where they're from. So that's why it come from different backgrounds and contexts. So that's why their perception is different. And also the legal and regulatory frameworks they are having in back in their country. And so also their educational background, uh, personal experience, and also the social and peer influence that they, because their friend doing like that. So that's why they just think that it's also okay for them. And also like personal value and belief, their own ethical stance, they think that it's okay. But uh, you know, like different people have different ethical stance. And I believe that the educational background could change people like perceptions, and <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and make them more aware of the importance of data and their personal information. So that's why I uh, proposed the reset about the uh, data ethics education, because I believe that uh, as a lecturer, 
So uh, the research questions of uh, my proposed uh, uh, proposal is like, how do IT and business university lecturers in Vietnam and Australia perceive the significance of data ethics education for students, uh, future careers and society at large? So uh, because um, the subjects that I'm teaching at my universities, we find things with the faculty to keep it, you know? People in the faculty of IT, they don't they care about much about technical stuff and skills rather than some, you know, social uh, involved um, subject like this. So we did try a lot to keep the subject for the students. So I believe that not all of the uh, practitioner and even lecturer, they have a um, like, you know, the good awareness about the importance of data ethics. So that's why I want to, uh, to see how IT and business university lecture in uh, both Vietnam and Australia perceived the significance of data ethics education. And then uh, what are the key similarities and differences in data ethics education perspective among like these lectures in Vietnam and Australia? So I believe that because of the contextual differences, so that's why there will be some similarities and a lot of differences. So I want to look closely into that. And then uh, what are the key considerations and pedagogical approaches like uh, that, that have been employed or proposed uh, by the, the lecturers in Vietnam and Australia in teaching data ethics. So in Vietnam, I believe that we have involved some uh, data ethics education into the like, data science education, but it's just a very small part of it considered as uh, data governance or management, but it's not something that people really prioritize and consider. So that's why I want to bring into attention that this is something that is not just a very small part of it, but it should be a, a course or a subject that be taught separately. And <clears throat> so the objective, I want to assess the perceived importance of data ethics education among the lecturers in uh, of all of the countries, and then compare their perceptions and then I want to identify the common perspective and then also to analyze the differences uh, uh, between the lectures and also to understand the contextual influences in their viewpoint. And uh, apart from that, I want to uh, document the key considerations in teaching data ethics among the university lecturers and also to compare the approach used for proposed IT and business lectures in both countries. So that is uh, the first stage or the first phase of the research. However, uh, the later phase, I want to use the first phase to set the stage for the next phases, which is the phase second, this phase two, gonna develop a specialized data ethics course that tailored to the specific needs of university students in Vietnam. And then the third phase gonna make this, special, uh, this specialized data ethics course accessible as OER to educate future and business professional with a focus on Vietnam, which I think it could be like replicate to different country, but maybe it need to tell a little bit to base, to fix to the, you know, the context different. So um, what I, uh, I intended to do with the de research design is gonna be mostly exploratory and descriptive at the later state. And uh, my uh, uh, philosophy is interpret the uh, Mostly I need to explore and interpret what I see in uh, from my own perspective. Uh, and then the approach will be inductive reasoning and with qualitative be the main uh, methodology uh, and submit structure as the tools, interviews, submit structure interviews. And then the participants will be university lectures from IT and business faculties in Vietnam and Australia. And of course, uh, it could be in different country if you would like to join me and make the research in your own uh, context, please uh, just contact me. Like uh, we can expand it a little bit. And then, um, yeah, so the contribution that I expected that I could make that is uh, to provide the insights into the perceived significance of data ethics education, which can inform curriculum development, and also to inspire innovation in teaching methods, like a uh, lecturer can also adapt and propose new teaching approach to make the data ethics education more engaging and effective, because it's, uh, it's a little bit complicated when we talk about legislation and GDPR and so on, so it could make it more engaging. 
and uh, help university promote ethical awareness among lecturers and students, and also inform development of uh, policy or legal, legal framework. Because I, as I know that back where I'm from, Vietnam, we don't have a very clear um, you know, le legal framework about the ethics. So I think it should be some space for people to work on that. And also to promote a more accountable and transparent society as uh, in general. So uh, I think, is, is it too fast or I still have some time? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so let's stay connected. <laughs> and if you are uh, you interested in uh, to be involved in my research and you have idea or you have some skills in, you know, digital ethics and or even in uh, the ways like um, developing OER because that will be uh, the skill we need at later stage of my research that I will be um, really happy to be connected and, and talk to you more about the potential of this research. Yeah, thank you so much. I'd like to salute the GoGN team and for the great work they are doing. And I'd like to say happy anniversary to all GoGN members. They are doing a great job. So this is a PhD research. And my topic is um, using open educational resources to advance higher education in Ghana. I will skip the definitions. So for my background, I looked at the negative effects of a high cost of traditional textbooks and the lack of contextually suitable materials. Um, in, our, in my part of the country here, in my part of the world here in Uganda, most of our textbooks are from the West. So scenarios and examples are not um, locally suitable to our environment here. This is one of the reasons why we advocate for open educational and um, resources. Now, the effect of high cost of traditional textbooks and the lack of uh, contextually suitable materials undermine um, the right to education. I also looked at um, the support that um, GoGN, the support that OER um, or the benefits of OER in terms of open education and distance education. And I also focused on um, the advantages of OER, especially in the provision of teaching and learning materials, which is a job of librarians. So I moved on to also look at um, the fact that since OER are beneficial to the job of librarians. Librarians have embraced it and have contributed in various ways, such as advocacy, seeking funding for OER projects, offering expertise adv advice on copyright and open license, providing access to existing OER, curating and dissemination of OER materials. Well, despite this nice picture or this evidence, the situation is not like that in Ghana. Unfortunately, there's very little support for OER from libraries or from libraries. We had two OER initiatives in the country, one on health training and the other on teacher um, training education. Now the one on health um, education came out with a report, uh, an evaluation report. And this report describes the involvement of librarians as disappointing. They also enumerated some challenges faced and this include locating existing OER materials and the lack of a system for dissemination of OER. I believe these are areas that librarians could have helped if they, if they were involved. So this is a problem that this study uh, aims to address. In view of this, the study seeks to investigate factors that determine academic librarians' intention to support 
we are in higher education institutions in Ghana. So specifically the objectives are to ascertain the awareness and perception of OER among academic librarians in Ghana, to identify their contributions so far, to assess the impact of existing ICT infrastructure and institutional policies on library support for OER, and to investigate the impact of OER competencies on librarians support, then to investigate factors that determine academic librarian support for OER in Ghana. At the end of the study, I hope to come up with uh, strategies that will enable academic librarians to support OER, uh, which will consequently eliminate some of the challenges uh, faced by OER team in the adoption of OER, as I mentioned earlier, dissemination issues. Um, consequently, to improve OER adoption um, and use in Ghana, and the ultimate benefit of providing access and availability of contextually um, suitable materials and reduced cost of education. Then, of course, the study who add to existing body of knowledge on OER in Ghana. I'll skip the scope. All right. So my literature review focused on the trends, the general trends in OER research, uh, and also the key issues in the objectives of the study. So in summary, what I realized is that studies on OER are predominantly from the North America, parts of Europe and Asia. But very few um, can be accredited or can be credited to um, countries in the global South, especially Ghana. And um, similarly, in terms of awareness, um, awareness is high among people in North America and parts of Europe and Asia, where it's very low in the global south. I also realized that most research on OER adoption focused on um, adoption among faculty and students. And however, the evidence of adoption on, among librarians can be found in uh, articles that reports um, the implementation of OER initiatives in various campuses. Now, on a library's contribution, I realized that some of the contributions made by libraries include advocacy, assessing access to existing OER, advice on copyright and open license agreements, curating, and dissemination of information. On the library's competency, um, it's established that Librarian support for OER um, stems from existing uh, library skills, such as uh, collection development, curation, dissemination of information, information retrieval, uh, among others. However, um, some studies have realized that librarians lack skills or knowledge in copyright and open license. On barriers of um, OER adoption among librarians, we have the fact that faculty are skeptical. They lack, there's lack of um, OER skills among librarians. There's lack of management support, lack of policy, corporate clearance, and lack of time for library staff. In the case of Ghana, I realized that librarians' support for um, existing OER projects was not commendable at all. And there seems to be no empirical studies investigating librarians' contribution um, towards OER objectives, uh, OER projects, sorry. 
I've identified two theories that underpin my studies, among several others that have been used in OER research. And these two are the unified theory of acceptance and use of technology in devotion of innovation theory. The unified theory has four dependence variables, performance expectancy, effort expectancy, social influence, facilitating conditions. It has two um, dependent variables and four moderating um, variables. Similarly, the diffusion of innovation also has five um, dependent variables. And from research, we realized that these variables are similar to that of the unified theory. Um, the, the, that of unified theory. Yeah. So what I intend to do is that uh, I have selected or chosen relative advantage, the first um, variable in DOI to replace uh, performance expectancy. And I'm doing this because um, you know that relative advantage, sorry. Relative advantage is uh, one of the themes that um, we use to support um, OER acceptance over the traditional um, textbooks, the use of traditional textbooks. So the relative advantage reflects the thing that that has always been echoed that OER it has relative advantage over traditional textbooks. So the review on literature around the two theories show that studies have established a relationship between the variables in the adoption of OER. Now, what the theories mean is that uh, people believe that if there's a presence of a variable, then a particular technology or innovation can be um, adopted. Also, most um, OER studies have used the unified and the DOI uh, among faculty and students, studies among faculty and students. Uh, there seems to be none on librarians. And this is indicative of the fact that there are a few studies regarding OER adoption among librarians. And there is a gap that um, this study will be addressing. So the research gaps that I found out is that uh, in Ghana, very little has been found um, about librarians' involvement in OER. And so far, there seems to be no empirical evidence um, sorry, empirical research to, that investigate factors that influence and um, librarian support for OER adoption. Also, I realized that most of the studies are case studies. Um, they use case study designs, and this affects the generalizability of the findings. So I decided to use um, these methods. My population, I'll collect data from lecturers and librarians in, in universities in Ghana. And I chose eight universities out of 25 accredited um, and chartered universities. This eight represents 30%. And I use Timani's formula to sample 342 librarians and 1,366 lectures. On my research approach, this is a pragmatic study. So it will involve deductive and inductive um, reasoning. Um, it's a mixed method study, specifically sequential explanatory. So I'll be doing survey interviews and also examine primary documents. It's a first national study. And my data collection instruments will be 
um, questionnaires, interview guide, and the primary documents. On analysis, um, the quantitative analysis will be general description of the variables. So I'll do inferential uh, analysis to establish comparison and relationship. I also do uh, perform peer correlation to show the relationship um, between the variables and to show the direction of the relationship. I also do um, simple regression to evaluate the ability of one variable um, to predict the other. On the qualitative data, I'll use thematic methods of analysis to identify themes and patterns, which will be organized into abstracts and means of information. I'm currently um, seeking ethical clearance with UNISA and an ethic, ethics body in Ghana here is a requirement. Um, afterwards, um, I also seek permission from gatekeepers and um, participants or respondents who also have forms, consent forms to endorse and others that will be required to all right, let me skip since, okay. All right, let me go back to, on validation, um, I intend to apply triangulation, so I'll cross-check data with other sources and confirm summary of findings with key participants. On dependability, the right participants will be engaged and external review to examine the research process and data, data analysis. Um, this study is original because it's the first to be undertaken in Ghana and the Sub-Saharan Africa to explore the support of academic librarians towards OER. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so... I'm standing up here feeling like I'm sort of peering over the shoulders of giants. And, uh, and that, that's a good thing. That's a good place to be. Um, my advisor told me yesterday, he said, everyone starts somewhere. So here I am just sort of starting. And this is big and it comes, um, it's a passion project uh, based on growing up in Papua New Guinea, seeing a lot of colonization, working in Micronesia where the US embassy uh, sent uh, hundreds of dollars worth of textbooks to a high school uh, where majority of the teachers didn't show up and the bathrooms didn't work. And so this, this um, I, you know, I, as I've been taking classes, I've been bebopping around, you know, we talk about assessment and then systems thinking. And of course, everyone attracts my attention. Um, but this is where I'm landing right now. And since I, since I put this in, I've already uh, moved the title to Open Education Practices and Critical uh, Pedagogy. Let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, it works. So I am not gonna read all of this at all, but I did have the, uh, the code there if you wanna read it yourself. But I'm just gonna tell my, um, again, my, my story. So, um, so there's the, uh, when I first started my uh, PhD, I was on sabbatical. So I spent a whole two days, I think, reading. Um, ah, ah, uh, I don't have, I don't have it in here. Any Freire's, Freire's book, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So I just in, in embraced it and I just enjoyed reading it. Um, I grew up with critical pedagogues. pedagogues. Like I said, um, my parents are both teachers. And so I, from a very, very young age, I've been learning about this. And um, uh, so I've seen this, I've seen it my whole life. And uh, when I went into uh, teaching myself, I also found that, you know, here's the textbook, teach from the textbook. But it just, you know, didn't relate to any of my students. And I knew that, and I could figure that out. 
So we really need to, um, the critical pedagogy that I've attached myself to is engage learning and then empowering uh, learners. And uh, so we know, we know that um, particularly in the United States right now, there's an incredible fear of uh, critical pedagogy. Matter of fact, I know that they've gone through uh, curriculum and objectives and just eliminate anything that has the word critical in it. Um, so uh, that's, that's motivating for me, so, uh, being an activist and a bit of a rebel. So uh, we need to, um, when I came to uh, open educational practices, I found a space that I could begin to teach well. And, um, and so uh, since, since then, since then, I've, I've uh, become the OR lead faculty at our, our small community college. And I've watched instructors go from uh, buying a textbook, lecturing, using all the quizzes, and then they're done teaching because they've filled up all their students. But as, as, as instructors have begun to develop their own materials and they begin to think about open pedagogy and all of a sudden those quizzes disappear and they, they find out who their learners are and it starts to work. So my project is mostly focused on um, how then does just the, the implementation of open educational practices in a teacher's classroom begin to resemble critical pedagogy. And it's really um, quite fun. This is just terrible, isn't it? Um, but, but my methodology will be, I'm a storyteller by nature and I grew up in storytelling country and I, I just, I like storytelling. So this is a qualitative study um, based on the stories that I know of, of um, instructors and so I did a little pilot study and I just interviewed three instructors and uh, they, um, without, without prompting, none of these instructors have an educational background, but they began talking about, I've become a zealot for open educational practices. I have, uh, I, students are collaborating and they tried open pedagogy and these students just are engaged and they're showing up to my classes and they're learning things and they want to go out and change the world. And this is what the implementation of open educational practices has done, has uh, done for these instructors in this small little pilot study. So I've completed the majority of my doctoral coursework. Like I said, it's a little bit like Alice in Wonderland. You mentioned the other um, earlier this morning, you know, this kind of takes my attention and there's all kinds of squirrels all over the place to look at. Um, but in the fall of next year, um, then I hope to uh, do a little bit more studying, of course, on uh, critical pedagogy. I'd like to learn more about transformative learning and um, someone mentioned I should start taking a look at Bridges transition model. I don't know anything about that yet, but I hope to. And then refine my interview questions. And um, of course, there's, there have been many people who have said, uh, just be careful of your own passions getting in the way. I'm not sure how I, what I believe about that quite yet, but um, to limit my own bias. I like storytelling and I think storytelling is really important and there's bias in storytelling. But anyway, I do, rec I do welcome criticisms and thoughts and your ideas and uh, you don't need to look at that. That's some of my references and you may see some of your names on there because like I said, I'm looking over the shoulders of giants here. Thank you. <laughs> You well, I'm Davis. Firstly, is not my principal language, so please be careful with that. Well, I will try to be careful with my words, but excuse me for that. <laughs> well, I will to introduce you, Edward. Edward, please one moment. 
Thank you, Virginia. Okay. Edward is a platform, a digital platform that offers free and open augmented reality resource for education to enhance the learning experience in STEAM. You know, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math areas. Uh, okay. Edward is a part of my thesis, is a big part of my thesis, but I'm my well, or team because he's Rosario and Jessica and me, Davis. We are part um, of this team of Edward. Um, I'm from Peru and my partners are from Mexico. But what is Edward? It's a repository. to any students or teachers. Inclusion, promote inclusion and equity in educational through technology. Educational innovation, because promote educational innovation and creativity to improve the quality of education. E, I know. <laughs> and for the last one, collaboration, because uh, encourage collaboration among teachers to share resource and educational experience. But do you know what is uh, augmented reality? Yes? Well, it's a lovely technology that is, for, uh, is free. Well, we have a lot of, of kind of resource, but the most of them are free. So we need, we, we see, we saw the possibility to make the resource um, for the teachers. So this uh, Edward has the augmented reality of principal technology to allow virtual objects to be superimposed of the real world. So mobile on other, on other devices. And in education, Augmented reality educational resource are application or experiences that use our AR technology to enhance teaching and learning. So, but what is augmented reality in education? Augmented reality in education uh, allows students to interact with educational resource in a more intensive and dynamic way. Uh, in addition, in also foster creativity and critical thinking by allowing students to explore and experiment with concept in a freer, in more personalized way. This is the, the page, uh, if you want to go. The problem here may be a problem that is in Spanish, so because we are in Latin America, but later we, we want to make it in any, many language. This is a experience we maybe we have a teacher that they he has the anatomy lesson. So we want to go to the repository Edward. We can choose at this place the apps. And later at the apps, I want to see the science. Anatomy is part of science. Later, I can go what kind of science? Uh, biology, physics, geography, chemistry. So I want biology, and later I will. I we we have more or less two hundred kind of, of apps different. So there is one anatomy. I can see the difference. Uh, hashtag that I can use because we we see that uh, that app is for uh, for high school or for, for primary or for high school. So there is a hashtag that we have a curation, maybe is a word? Yeah, is a curation. So uh, we can go to the app. This is a brief of this app, a little video for, for that page and you can go to the link for that app. So maybe we have a, a lot of information that we want to go to the teachers. That problem here for, for us is how 
they know about Edward this moment. So we were using this app in classroom. Um, he, she's my friend, uh, Rosario, and she has uh, many uh, students that they are using these apps uh, at classroom. So, There are many examples about uh, technology with augmented reality in that class. Different apps that they are in the Edward repository. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Jenny Heyman. <laughs> which I love saying. Part of my journey uh, and part of the reason I wanted to pursue doctoral studies is very selfish. Uh, I was an instructional designer when I started out and I would come to meetings with professors who felt that not having a doctor in front of your name made you less worthy, <laughs> less smart uh, and not an expert. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to overcome that a little bit. It's one of, one of the impetus, but not all of them. Um, so I just want to share with you a little bit about my, the current state of my research. I was really excited to hear from Evelyn about her research that's very pragmatic. <laughs> she talked about diffusion of innovation, which I talk about, um, and various models of um, self-perception of skills and, and the ways in which very applied, pragmatic practice, taking a MOOC, for example, was part of my original dissertation work. How does that help faculty learn more about OER? Uh, and even influence their behavior to use them. So the project I have in motion is actually a five-year follow-up on my, it's been five years since I finished my dissertation, uh, shocking to me. Um, and I wanna follow on with my participants to see what type of persistence they're feeling in their use of OER uh, based on what they learned at the time uh, and the intervening COVID-19 situation um, well, how are they doing? Uh, and the other thing that's really important about diffusion of innovations, and this is Everett Rogers' work, uh, the diffusion of innovations book is about that thick. So often when we talk about diffusion of innovations, we see Everett's little diagram that shows early adopters and middle adopters and laggards, which is one of my favorite words <laughs> in education. Um, but there's really a very in-depth theory and very pragmatic applied practice in his diffusion of innovations work. Um, one of the things he says, I think that's really important for us to consider is that it takes a very long time for some innovations to take hold. For example, he uses seatbelts. <laughs> the use of seatbelts in the US took a very long time to really take hold. Uh, even though it was clear it was a good innovation for human safety. Um, the metric system in Canada took a really long time to change from imperial to metric in Canada. Uh, some people still talk about pounds rather than kilos and so on. Um, so I think that's a really important part of it. So I want to check in with my folks longitudinally to see how they're doing. Uh, I collected my, my uh, data very recently. So this is another thing for PhD students to realize that research ethics boards can sometimes take a long time to, to approve your project. So get ahead of it uh, if you need approval for data collection. Um, so some of the things that I'm seeing in my uh, analysis of that research, uh, one of the interesting things is that a couple of folks no longer work in education since five years. Some folks are unemployed. One of them was unemployed. And I thought to myself, I had not been very inclusive in my invitation and my research to think through uh, how those folks were doing five years later in COVID. So I think that's an important element. Uh, so I'm gonna compare some of the 2018 data to the 2023 data in terms of people's self-perception of their skills, their decisions about how they use the OER. Uh, I think that's gonna be interesting. Uh, the, other uh, the other project that I'm working on, I have a proposal. Uh, it's called Working Together for the SDG, Student Success Through Collaboration. And this uh, project is going to focus on <clears throat> undergraduate students coming into 
uh, undergraduate business school programs. That happens to be the area my co-researchers work in. And what we're seeing in Canada, and I don't know if it's, we're seeing this elsewhere, is that direct from high school students, because of COVID, uh, are experiencing gaps in their skills. Their writing skills, numeracy, critical thinking. Um, and when they come to post-secondary, they're not doing very well. <laughs> they're failing their first semester, uh, which is really problematic for them, for their families. It's a problem. Uh, and so what we want to see is if there is a way in their first semester, if we can create a course, an open course, a MOOC, um, that helps to address some of those skills with those students as partners, um, does that help them persist and be successful in their programs as they go? So it's a little bit longitudinal, and it's going to rely on a MOOC. Uh, and one of the key parts of that is using the sustainable development goals as the curriculum. Uh, as group projects, we want the students to take the UN Sustainable Development Goals, choose one, and then do a project to help solve it. All of me, all the while, we're tricking them a little bit into using numeracy, research, data analytics, all those skills that we feel are going to be helpful to them in order to graduate successfully from their programs. Uh, so we're really super excited about that. Um, I tend to live in mixed method research. <laughs> it's just where I go because I'm very applied. Uh, action research in particular. We're going to create an intervention uh, in the form of a MOOC for these students, invite national groups of faculty and students from across Canada to be part of it. Uh, we're going to gamify it. One of my co-researchers is terrific at gamification in data analytics. Tricky to, to be that, but he's very good at it. So those are the things we're currently trying. Um, that in place probably in spring 2025. Um, so I think that's gonna be a very exciting project to see how that pans out in terms of student success uh, past the MOOC and if it's helpful to them. I also have a new project idea. Uh, I like to talk through lots of ideas. So one of the things I noticed at my institution and, and probably most of you can relate is that we're not talking about what happened during the pandemic. We're glossing over it. We're returning to in-person learning. Uh, everybody, I, <laughs> I can't tell you how excited people on campus are about the return to in-person learning. As a longtime online instructional designer and advocate, I'm like, hey, wait a minute. There's still a lot of good things that happened during COVID around online. But there's also some really strong struggles that we faced as institutions, as, as people, our students certainly face them. Uh, and I think it's important that we take a time to reflect on that and to decide what it is that we learned from it. So this project is going to probably to take the form of uh, a splot. <laughs> Those of you who know Al Levine, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, develop a website where we can invite educators or anyone who's interested. So this is always an open project. Um, to consider these types of questions. Uh, and the really important part of this project is going to be, what hopeful actions do you think we can take uh, personally, professionally, institutionally, to make sure that we're prepared for any future problems we might face at this global disruptive level? Uh, and certainly most importantly, to learn from our students what they would like us to do institutionally. So that's kind of the the gist of the work I'm doing. Be happy to answer any questions. And also always looking for collaborators. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jenny. I can see Rob, you've got your hand up here. So just a quick thing really. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of work recently on innovation and theorizing innovation around OER, partly through the Encore project, which is uh, coming to a conclusion after three years. It's the European Network for Catalyzing Open Resources in Education. And I lead the Innovation and Business Models work package. So we've got a bunch of resources coming out that if you have that innovation focus, we use things like Rogers and plus some other stuff. And I've used, created, instruments for collecting data using these theoretical frameworks. It's all CC BY, so you know you can do what you, what you like with it, basically. Yeah. Um, but I also think that this kind of um, post-pandemic, like what's changed uh, stuff is really essential and really interesting. And it's 
there's there's a, there's a little bit too much sometimes of like oh, that's all in the past now and it's understandable right yes but there's an ongoing things that are happening and it's um, really important to pay attention to that so yeah thanks great thanks yeah as human beings it is our it's in our survival nature to deny that things were difficult we have to move forward uh, we have to move on to the next thing it's just how we are as humans but we miss an opportunity if we don't take a chance to think what did we learn Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, Jenny. I love this stuff. This is really exciting. And I also teach a critical literacy and am seeing students in person for the first time since the pandemic myself. So um, based on the other project you have there, uh, the, the, MOOC, um, the, the MOOC to support undergrad acquisition of essential skills, um, I, I, I also like the uh, SDG focus, are you going to have social emotional pieces of this MOOC as well as the numeracy and literacy? So the social, it's, it's funny, we, you know, the whole soft skills spectrum of, of, of important skills that we learn. I, I feel like the SDGs are, in, are inherently bring those values, those personal ideas right to the front. Students are exceptionally engaged when you put the sustainable development goals in front of them. They may never have heard of them. And they're like, oh, this is my future. We're talking about planet from a planetary point of view. They're very, very engaged with it. Um, and we're seeing that. I know Gina's doing work with SDGs, OE for, OE for BW. Um, students are very motivated from a values, social, emotional perspective. Thank you. Any other questions at all? Great, please. Uh, so thank you a lot, Jenny. So I really like the working proposal, the working together for the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. So I, in my teaching, there is also uh, four subjects about uh, digital ethics. And we also have one activity that uh, for one week, the students need to stay together and work, uh, use the sustainable development goals. Like they need, we assign them with uh, with different groups, one different goals. And uh, also they need to work on the, uh, the principles for digital development. You know, like they, their goals is to um, find a technical solution for one sustainable development goal. So for example, like the zero hunger. So they will need to find a technical solution and develop the, you know, the system for, to solve the problem in that, uh, uh, for that goal. And they need to consider some principles, digital principles, and one of it is the use of open standards, open data, open talks, and open innovation as well. So students were very engaging and they really interest, like um, uh, put a lot of effort into the work collaboratively like together. And I think, um, yeah, the use of sustainable development goals for students to work together to solve different um, matters, this very interesting ways, yeah. Good work. Thank you. Yeah, and, and definitely in the design of, uh, and the teaching of it, bringing open, principles of openness, again, to those social and emotional values um, to the project is gonna be really important. We're gonna create a competition and hopefully get a very strong funder for that, um, for the students, for the, for the best solution that they come up with related to the SDGs. And we'll have to be careful about criteria about what best means, um, but hopefully, you know, those students can get some scholarship money and that helps in the engagement level and the interest and the, a little bit of the gamification if it's a little competitive, as long as it's a safe environment. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share with you a research that I've just started. Um, I also finished my PhD as COVID started and we went into emergency remote teaching, even though we were distance education, but everything had to go online. And a lot of our admin people didn't have access to devices or the internet. Um, from home, so the academic staff took on everything. So I feel a little bit like I've lagged in doing anything since my PhD, but it just was humanly impossible with the hours that we were working and teaching. And I have courses with about 3,000 students per semester, so it's a lot of marking and um, yeah, massive courses. 
So my um, interest here comes in that I'm on the national consumer uh, financial education committee is spearheaded by our national treasury and they've got legislation which says that they need to educate uh, consumers so it's in the financial literacy sphere um, and so I've been wanting to introduce OERs to the people that I've worked with but they very scared as soon as you say anything because they think they're going to be giving their copyright away and they um, they all do courses, they're not allowed to sell products, but they brand their, um, you know, their courses. So, that, for example, funeral covers and, um, you know, calculators. And so that's why I'm looking at the financial services industry. I am an accountant. I um, am a pragmatist, so I'm putting it out there. I don't do <laughs> philosophical <laughs> thinking. I'm very... Um, analytical in terms of and it must be practical uh, what I'm looking at so with a colleague of mine we're busy looking at developing a South African financial education portal that's the overriding project and it's got four aspects to it the one is a repository of uh, financial education content and then the looking at a quality mark in terms of the content that is put on the portal, certification of financial education providers, and then um, a hub for insights and evidence. So my part of the study in the first phase, I'm particularly looking at the repository of financial education content. The approach that we're using is the quintuple helix um, model to visualize the interaction. So this looks at civil society, academia, government, uh, industry, all working together within a certain environment. And it really reflects the interactions of this committee that we work on, where we represent academia, there's government, um, a lot of the financial services industry are, are industry. So we approaching it within this model and then interestingly we're using the living lab um, inter integrative process so uh, collaboration between all of us to create a solution to to problems so the space that i'm looking at now in the beginning is the the problem space where you empathize with the um, community and have a look at um, your practice and it's looking at the problems that uh, they um, in, you know, come across in their work. So have a look at the problem space with the empathizing and looking at the financial system. Although there's a lot of money put into um, financial education for consumers, it, there is still a limited budget. And uh, we found that there's a duplication of, of effort. So there's a lot of uh, financial service providers that are providing the same educational content. All of them do a funeral policy. Uh, that's, sorry, that's quite big in, in Africa um, in terms of providing for funerals. So that's a big um, education space um, and there's a lack of collaboration so obviously there's a uh, duplication um, of resources money and effort and then there's also gaps in coverage because they are all looking at specific areas there's other areas that uh, there's absolutely no coverage on in terms of financial education and then the lack of awareness of of OER. So I've been following your um, Encore um, workshops and I had a chat with Orna Farrell uh, two weeks ago and um, looking at um, yeah, business awareness of OER. So for me, it's a little bit more, it's a bit exciting to be going into a new area. I mean, I haven't conquered the education side. There's still a huge lack of awareness in academia, but this, this excites me in terms of um, encouraging uh, business to have a look at the benefits of OER. So um, I've got sabbatical next year, so I've just put in for my ethics. Luckily, in our university, um, our ethics procedures are, are very quick, and I've just received ethics for um, 
two, two articles. So the first one, I want to look at the concept of um, OER and for-profit and um, how, you know, where there's an overlap between the two and where the benefits um, can be mutual. And then the big part of the study is I want to understand um, in this financial services industry, uh, how they interpret financial uh, open licenses, um, what their challenges are, how can we encourage, I mean, they all in competition with each other, but so how can we encourage this collaboration and, you know, engage with them and show them how, you know, the resources will be um, spread more efficiently. Um, and yeah, just through interviews, in-depth interviews, um, identify and understand the challenges that they feel that they face so that, um, we can come up with a solution through openly licensing uh, some vanilla content that they can then um, brand themselves for the different. So yeah, that's just an overview of what I'm looking at doing for the next two years.